This Week in IT. The Windows control panel is back from the dead. LinkedIn is moving from CentOS. Microsoft will discuss Windows security at an upcoming conference. And I have some updates on Microsoft 365. So stay tuned to find out more. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I discuss everything connected to Windows, Azure and Microsoft 365. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at Semperis. But before I get started today, I've got a quick favour to ask you. A whopping 84% of the people who watched last week's video weren't subscribed to the channel. Now, as we go live today, we're on about 7,580 subscribers. I'd love it if we could push that up to 7,600 this week. So if you'd like to see these weekly news updates from Petri.com, Please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. If you follow the tech news, you probably notice various news stories circulating earlier this week that Microsoft was preparing to deprecate the Windows control panel. The Windows control panel is, of course, a legacy component in Windows. The settings app is where Microsoft would prefer that you changed all the system settings and personalization configuration in Windows. It's a more modern interface and it's also designed for touch. Now, we don't know whether Microsoft is eventually going to kill off the control panel. I would imagine that will probably be the plan because you don't want to have to maintain and support these two interfaces for controlling settings in Windows. At the end of the day, it just doesn't make much sense. But the settings app has been around for a long time now, and it's clear that not all of the settings that you can still control today in the control panel have moved over to the new settings app. Now, when Microsoft made this post earlier this month, there was a bit of a backlash among users saying, well, we still use the control panel and we don't appreciate the fact that Microsoft is planning to deprecate it. So it was a bit of a PR disaster for the company. But earlier this week, Microsoft backtracked and it updated that blog post and changed the language to say that it was was not deprecating the control panel anymore, but that it was simply migrating many settings from the control panel to the settings app. Now, of course, that's something that we've known for a long, long time. So there's nothing really to see here at the moment. The control panel is probably going to be around for some time to come. So don't panic if that's an interface that you or your users are still familiar with using. Last month's big crash that involved CrowdStrike and it managed to bring down 8.5 million PCs around the world is still fresh in people's minds. There's been a lot of talk about what could be done better to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again in the future. Microsoft is preparing to talk about those issues with security partners and government at its Redmond campus on September the 10th next month. But before I look at exactly what's going to be discussed there, here's a quick message from our sponsor of today's video, Semperis. Did you know that Active Directory is exploited in 9 out of 10 cyber attacks? Once cyber criminals control your Active Directory, it's game over. With access to AD, attackers can gain control of your entire network. And if AD goes down, business comes to a halt. And it's not just on-premises Active Directory that's under attack. Cyber criminals are targeting Azure Active Directory too. Attackers can gain entry in the cloud and move to on-premises identity systems or vice versa. To keep threat actors out, you need to find and fix Active Directory security gaps. Meet Purple Knight, your ally in defending against adversaries trying to breach your hybrid Active Directory environment. Purple Knight is a free Active Directory security assessment tool built by some Paris identity experts. With Purple Knight, you can spot Active Directory vulnerabilities before attackers do. Purple Knight scans your hybrid environment for hundreds of indicators of exposure or compromise in both on-premises Active Directory and Azure AD. Purple Knight gives you an overall security score and prioritized remediation guidance for fixing AD security vulnerabilities. 
Quickly to recap the technical details, this bug was caused by the Falcon sensor that's part of the CrowdStrike endpoint security software for Windows. And what happened was essentially an update to the security definitions was pushed out. And because the Falcon sensor runs in kernel mode, that update was fed into that kernel mode driver. And because it basically contained a whole load of zeros, it managed to crash the driver and cause a blue screen of death anywhere where the Falcon sensor was installed. Now, there are a few things that Microsoft has already publicly discussed along with CrowdStrike about this issue, but it's been highlighted at the upcoming conference, they're going to focus on two things, I'm sure other things as well. The first is that they're trying to move Windows kernel developments from uh, non-memory safe languages over to Rust, which is a memory safe language, and it helps to reduce the potential security issues in critical code like an operating system kernel. That's something that we've talked about on this channel before. That's something that's gradually happening with every new version of Windows that's released. A little bit more of the kernel is being moved over to Rust. But of course, it doesn't apply just to the kernel. It can also apply to other code, especially code that's running as part of the kernel, anything that's critical, essentially, that runs on Windows. Another thing they're going to discuss, which I thought was really interesting, is the adoption of the Berkeley packet filter, eBPF for short. Now, this is something that comes from Linux and it was originally developed as a uh, networking packet filter to allow security software to essentially observe things that are going on in the kernel without having direct access to critical kernel code. Back in 2020, 2021, Microsoft announced that it was working on porting this Linux technology, which a lot of security companies are already familiar with, to Windows. Now, it's not built into Windows. It's something that you can use and add to Windows as part of your security software. And it basically allows that goodness that we have in Linux to also be utilized with a few minor changes, of course course for the porting to Windows. Now this was all talked about a couple of years ago and I went over to the GitHub page to see what the status of the project is and as far as I can work out it's something that you can use but it's still a work in progress so I'm not sure whether Microsoft actively support it or what's going on with that. I'd love to know in the comments below if you know more about it but it is something they're going to discuss at this upcoming conference how how software like CrowdStrike could utilize that technology on Windows. In terms of Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, I did manage to find some documentation that talks about implementing this filter or the way that product implements the filter on Linux. But interestingly, I didn't find the same documentation for Windows. So I don't know whether Microsoft's own security software uses that filter or not. But regardless of whatever the status of it is at the moment, it looks like it's something Microsoft might push a bit harder in the future to improve the security of Windows all round. Microsoft and Linux, of course, this is something you hear more and more frequently these days <laughs> compared to when Steve Barmer was basically out there saying that Linux was like a cancer and all of this terrible stuff. Microsoft now embraces Linux. One of the things that people always find surprising is that Microsoft Azure runs on Windows Server. The infrastructure is built on top of Windows Server. It's not built on top of Linux. Now that's not to say that most of the virtual machines that run on top of that Hyper-V infrastructure aren't running Linux, of course, because they are. And we know that I think over 50% of all the VMs that run in Azure run Linux and not Windows Server. But the actual underlying infrastructure is provided mainly by Windows Server, but not exclusively. There are some things, Azure services, and I think Kubernetes also uh, run on Linux. They run on Azure. 
Azure Linux. So this is something that started as an internal uh, distribution of Linux that Microsoft developed, and they have now made this a public open source version of Linux that you can download from GitHub if you want. You can choose to use it if you want to install Linux in a VM or a container in Azure, as far as I understand. This week, Microsoft announced that LinkedIn, which of course is a, a website that they purchase, will be changing from CentOS, which is managed and run by a Red Hat, to Azure Linux. Now, why are they making this change? There's been some concern around CentOS and the future of it because of the way that Red Hat has approached updating it and the timelines for those updates and the lack of support coming from Red Hat. So this seemed like a good time for Microsoft to move LinkedIn over to its own Linux distribution. With that, there are some potential improvements coming to Azure Linux that are gonna benefit everybody. So Microsoft is saying that they're going to provide strong support for Azure Linux. There are going to be some technical enhancements like added XFS support and developed tools for deploying via Metal as a Service. Microsoft has built out a repository of signed kernels and internal container image repository for Azure Linux. And there's going to be improved connectivity for IDEs running locally to remote Azure Linux VMs, supporting GPUs across multiple regions. Let's look at some of the changes to Microsoft 365 that are coming up. They announced this week that there are going to be improvements to the Exchange Online message recall feature. The first of which is that users can now be notified, that is something that administrators can configure, can now be notified if a message is recalled because it caused confusion, of course, if the message had been read and then it mysteriously disappeared maybe from the user's inbox. Administrators can now set a notification to reduce confusion around that. Microsoft is adding configurable recall limit so administrators will be able to change the default limit which is one year and it'll be configurable from five days up to ten years and for organizations that have complex email routing scenarios there's going to be support for external routing so if a message goes out of your Microsoft 365 tenant and then back into Exchange Online. This is going to improve the reliability of the recall feature for those complex routing scenarios. Microsoft also announced that the OneDrive web application is getting better search facilities to help users find more easily the things that they need, especially in subfolders. So Microsoft has said that it's adding advanced filters. So there are gonna be new filters for file types and modification dates. There's going to be a new column to easily locate files across OneDrive shared folders and document libraries. Simplified scoping options, so enhanced options for precise searches within folders, sites or document libraries, and a change to the UI that's going to add more metadata to help users identify the right files more easily. Let me know in the comments below what you think about the search functionality across Microsoft 365. I still think there's a way to go for improving it even beyond what Microsoft has announced this week. For instance, when you share a file in Teams, it would be nice to know exactly where that file is stored rather than me having to go to dig for it or really understand what's going on. Of course, most users don't really understand where the file is stored and that storage location can vary quite a lot depending on where you share the file and how you share the file. So some additional information around that I think might be useful. Maybe not, maybe it overcomplicates things. Let me know what you think in the comments below. One last story that I thought was interesting that it's now possible to test in preview mode the new hot patching feature that's gonna come in Windows Server 2025 later this year. Now, this feature is going to be part of the standard and data center editions of the upcoming server release. It's something that you'll be able to use on premises, but you'll only be able to use this feature if the server is managed by Azure Arc, and that requires a monthly subscription. Now, this is the same essentially as the hot patching that's available today in Windows Server Azure Edition, which of course is something you have to 
pay for on a monthly basis. So Microsoft is kind of saying, well, okay, we're going to give this feature to you on premises, but we're still going to make you pay a monthly fee to use it whatever the situation, you know, they're trapping you into that. Nevertheless, I think this is one of the more interesting features coming up in Windows Server 2025 that will probably mean many organizations would like to upgrade to it, potentially along with the security enhancements coming to Active Directory. So do check that out. If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up. It helps us to get the video seen by more people on YouTube. I'm going to share another video with you now that you might also find useful. Last week I covered the changes that Microsoft has made to Loop in the latest version of the software, Loop 2.0, and I look at whether it is really ready to compete with Notion. So do check that out. I'd like to thank again the sponsors of this week's video, Semperis, but that's it for me for this week, and I'll see you next time.